But uh, with that reminder, let me pass over directly to, uh, to Professor John Rawls, uh, a, 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 a member of Emmanuel College in Cambridge. Uh, he's the um, Arab and Royal Academy Professor of Engineering uh, and Transitional Energy Strategies uh, at the University. And he's here to talk to us about the technology aspect of technology and the electrification of transport. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Chairman, and uh, thank you for the previous lecture. And I think the message coming from the previous lecture is how important our attitudes are. And I think that that is absolutely central to the opportunities that are being opened up by the new technologies that we have a look at. So my brief is to talk a bit about those technologies, perhaps the hard stuff, but I don't in any way want to uh, suggest that the soft stuff and the things that we've just been hearing about are unimportant. On the contrary, I think probably they are the more important things. But the technology itself, how might that reshape the way we travel? And it's an exciting time to be talking about this sort of thing. Uh, Sarah spoke a few moments ago uh, about future technology and the need to trust in autonomous vehicles. She showed an image of the Lutz Pathfinder pod, which is uh, an autonomous pod designed to be a taxi at some stage in the future. Um, this is the second generation, and in such a short space of time, we're already looking at a new pod. This is only a year or two after the Lutz pod. This is the UK Autodrive pod, which we'll be taking to the streets in the same locality as the Lutz pod in the fairly near future. And you can see just by looking at it, first of all, that it's a different pod. Uh, but there's more inside that gives away uh, the... the uh, it gives clue to the differences. And these things are beginning to happen at such a rate and at such a concentration that real momentum is being built up here in the UK. There have been many claims that the UK should be at the forefront of all this technology. Interestingly enough, the climate is being created here in the UK that some of those claims might actually become true, and wouldn't, wouldn't that be nice? A lot of it, though, has to be played out in the street because a fundamental point about a lot of these autonomous technologies uh, is that it depends on how they interact with people, the point made in the previous lecture. So you cannot proof test them in a laboratory like you can an engine. You have to proof test them in the real theatre, in the physical uh, and, and real environment. So we need urban laboratories, places where we can test these technologies on the ground amongst people. And Milton Keynes is fast becoming you know, the UK's urban laboratory. There are a lot of things going on in this city, which mean these new, new technologies are being deployed concurrently in the real theatre. So this is an exciting time. And the UK Autodrive project, which I mentioned a few moments ago, is the biggest of the government's three driverless cars projects, which it currently has running. It is the biggest by far. And it is being played out in Milton Keynes, and it has two fundamental components. The one on the left is to do with what we would uh, conventionally understand as cars, road-going cars. And the bit on the right is to do with something which we wouldn't recognise, which is these autonomous taxis, which run around pedestrianised space and are intended to provide a first and last mile transport system. So two very different applications of a common autonomous technology, both being played out in theatre uh, by way of exploration and demonstration. Uh, and for the cars, there will be a series of challenge events on public roads under controlled conditions where people will actually be able to see these vehicles performing, uh, and sometimes performing in a mixed environment with normal cars on the road. Uh, and uh, in terms of the driverless pods or taxis, this LSAT system, low-speed autonomous transport system, uh, will be demonstrated with a fleet of some 40 pods providing a quasi-public service. And this is an early uh, artist's impression of what those pods might look at. You can see that they have evolved from my previous slide, but they've also evolved on the inside. So if we step inside this latest pod, the auto drive pod, you can see the array of screens on the inside, and it doesn't take much imagination to see the next step, 
which will be a fully immersive environment. So whilst you're inside this pod now, you could be travelling to the moon if you care to dial up that option. And as you travel down the streets, you don't see necessarily what's outside. You see whatever you want to do, or what you want to see, and you do whatever you want to do. You may wish to play an immersive game. You may wish to watch the news, or you may wish simply to look out of the windows. In which case, you can make the screens um, transparent, and you can see out. Fantastic opportunities. So it doesn't seem far away then, if we can do this in these pods today, that we will move to the sort of vehicle that was shown by uh, Daimler-Benz a little while ago, which is simply a different sort of vehicle. This is now a vehicle that is not so much for travelling, although of course it does move. It is rather a place which moves in which you do your work or in which you enjoy yourselves. The seats don't even face forward. The seats swivel round and you talk to the people that are inside the pod. It may be a meeting room for business, it may be a cinema. It happens to move on wheels. And at the same time as that technology is appearing on our streets, we may see a pedestrianised Oxford and Regent Street and we may see these pods moving amongst pedestrians in a fully integrated sort of mixed environment. Jolly exciting stuff. And I could speak for a long time on what I think are the potential of these technologies to provide these sort of services around our cities. It won't be long, I think, before we're seeing these things in reality beginning to appear on the streets. But whilst those things deal with anywhere to anywhere travel, you call it when you need it and you take it to the place you want and then you get out, there are different sorts of motion in our cities, and I want to talk about the second type. This first type, the one I've just been talking about, is Brownian motion. You sort of go anywhere to anywhere, it's happening all the time, people are moving all around cities, very random sort of stuff. But you also have superimposed on cities very predictable flows, very big tidal flows of people coming in and out, like the commuter flows. So, Although we could speak about the Brownian motion forever this evening, I'd just like to talk about some of the technologies, the exciting technologies in Brownian motion, and just explore how they might be applied to this other problem of tidal flow. Tidal flow is very much dominated by this sort of motion. This is looking at Cambridge. And in the morning, we have all the vehicles flowing in and all the vehicles flowing out. And they add up in Cambridge to a peak daily inflow of 7,500 vehicles per hour, 10,000 people an hour in round terms. That's what's flowing into Cambridge and clogging up the streets, and the same thing in the reverse direction in the evening. How do we deal with that? And does this autonomous vehicle technology have anything to offer? Well, tidal flows are traditionally solved by these sort of mass transit systems, the train, and the tram. So every city that has a tidal flow problem, and many of them do, start looking at these solutions. And I'll show this slide of several times this evening, so please get used to it, because this is a very important slide. What this tells you is roughly what it costs to put a, bit, a mass transit system on the ground in reality. So we have a series of different systems up the left-hand side there and a series of prices across the uh, bottom. And you can see that to build a single carriageway road through just you know, virgin territory, down the bottom left-hand corner, that's the cheapest thing you can do. And right up the top right-hand corner, the most expensive thing you can do is build a new urban heavy rail system. So that's the layout, but the point behind this slide is you may have any technology you like, and it's jolly exciting if you do, but what's going to cost you the money is the old-fashioned stuff. It's the civil engineering, sadly. So you can have any technology you like, but watch the money and therefore watch the civil engineering. And if we talk about these conventional systems that I've just been talking about, tram and, and rail, it sits sort of in the middle of our chart here, anywhere between 25 million and 65 million pounds per mile. So if you're putting 10 miles of tram into Nottingham, that'll cost you 300 million quid, just like that. And that's just a straight line tram. So that's a lot of money to pay to move these tidal flows, particularly if you've got tidal flows coming from different directions. So can the new technologies help us to get us out of this bind? Well, my title is Professor of Transitional Energy Strategies, and the transitional is a very important word because it means I have to focus on things that might really happen tomorrow. I have to look for solutions that are innovative on the one hand, but make sense to a real businessman on the other. So in asking that question, can the technologies get us out of this bind for our mass flow type uh, problems, 
I'd like to look for a situation where I could actually do something tomorrow. So how about this as a starting point? The Abbey Line. It runs from Watford to St Albans. It's one of those little spur lines that sort of somehow got overlooked by Dr Beeching. Uh, and it looks like this. If you go to one of the stations along the route, it's a pretty sort of basic railway. Uh, and if you look at the line that it runs on, it is now down to a single line. It is about the cheapest, uh, I was going to say most cheerful, but it probably isn't a very cheerful. Uh, it's the cheapest form of rail you can uh, consider, and that's what it does. And basically, it transports about 600 people an hour for an hour and a half in the morning, does nothing during the day, and then transports 600 people an hour for an hour and a half in the evening. Costs a lot of money to do that. How could technologies help us? Well, first of all, suspend your mind, stop thinking about a railway, start thinking about a road. In the UK, we are again in a leadership position. We are about to put on our roads some, uh, some uh, demonstrations of convoying. These are lorries where only the first driver, the driver of the first vehicle, is active. All the other drivers, in theory, could put their feet on the dashboard and go to sleep because these vehicles are electronically following each other. They follow the leader. So convoy technology is with us today. It will be demonstrated in public on our motorways within the next 18 months. So this is today's tomorrow, uh, technology, not tomorrow's. This is the Tesla. Everybody loves talking about Teslas because they do all sorts of fantastic things. This vehicle steers itself. It will go down the road fully with your hands off Take your hands off and your feet off. There's three stages of autonomous control. Hands off, feet off, brain off. Right? This is hands and feet off. This is 60% of the way. This vehicle will follow the white lines down the road and it'll stop if a vehicle stops in front of it, all automatically. This is happening today. And it does it by visual systems. It can see what's coming. It follows the lines. It'll steer around curves. It'll adjust your speed in the light of anything else that might get in the way. Could we use these technologies to do something about the Abbey line that I just spoke about? Well, you saw the line, the picture of the line going ahead of you. To put this sort of technology in its place, you'd need something like this. This actually is just a road, a very simple road. And it costs three to five million pounds a mile. This is a very low cost. This is disappearing off the left-hand part of my diagram. So if we were to build a system where we ripped up this track and put down that sort of simple tarmac road, then on our graph here, we would be right down there. So that's transformed the cost of that system. What would we put on it? Well, we wouldn't put a train on it. We'd put a bus on it. This is a bus. It has steerable rubber-tired wheels, but it goes at 120 miles an hour. It's driverless. It has all electric traction, typically 45, 50 seats capacity, and electronically coupled together like the convoy of lorries. So we can put three of these together and get 150 people capacity, five of them, and we can get even more. Very flexible system, and this vehicle costs 500,000 pounds a pop. The tram will cost you the best part of three million pounds a pop. So that's a huge difference, and it means that this Abbey line even being fairly conservative and allowing quite a lot of money for the uh, ripping up of the old track and putting down the new blacktop and refurbishing all the stations for 100 million pounds, which sounds like a lot of money, but when you're in the rail business, you have to say it quickly. Actually, it's not an awful lot of money. This is a pretty cheap option, and all the vehicles that you would need would be less than 5 million pounds. So in round terms, for 100 million pounds, we could transform that Abbey line into something which will deliver two to 3,000 passengers per hour versus the 600, which it can do at present. And there are other lines around which you could be amenable to this sort of approach. This one's a good one, the East-West Rail, the so-called brain train from Oxford to Cambridge. The western part of it, pretty well done, but the eastern part of it is a gaping hole. Particularly the central part of it, Bedford to Cambridge, there is no railway, there is no route. This is a place where we could really exercise the option of the sort of thing that I have just shown. We could be looking at delivering two to 3,000 passengers per hour over this longer distance of 25 miles for something of the order of 250 million pounds. If you look up your tables of how much it costs to build railways, this is bargain basement time. That's all very well for these little sort of beaching lines that sort of you know, missed the axe or these sort of wannabe lines that aren't yet built. 
They go across the country. It's bound to be an easy case. What about our cities? Because that's where I started, and that's what we really need to address. Almost all the cities in the UK want to have a mass transit system. They all want trams or something like a tram. It's, it's sort of, you know, how big muscles have you got? And an awful lot of cities have gained them over the last 25 years. It's been very popular. Look at this graph. This shows how the ridership patterns on light rail and trams, urban light rail and trams, has changed over the period 1981, uh, sorry, 1983, and, until just about present. It's shot up. Huge increases there. Lots of different cities coming in with different colours. Got to keep it in perspective, of course. It is just that top line there. Those other lines are London Underground and National Rail. Look how many people London Underground shifts in the national scheme of things. Never mind, back to my main point about light rail. Although it's a small part on the top there, it is significant and it's growing. It, every city wants one. And of course, every city starts by saying they want a tram. And then the problem is it costs 20 to 30 million pound a mile. And we get back to the problem I spoke of a few moments ago. Most cities cannot afford this. You have to have 10,000 passengers an hour to get anywhere close to making this sort of thing you know, fundable. And 10,000 passengers an hour is a very big number. So most cities can't do it, QED. Not a very good story. It isn't just that. It's if you're going to put a tram through the midst of your city, you've got to dig up the whole of the main street. So you've got to do this sort of thing. So not only is it very expensive, it is hugely disruptive. So how can we avoid that? Well, the only obvious way of getting around that problem is not to disrupt the street, which means probably you have to go underground. Sadly, that puts you into this sort of thing. This is all the old boring civil engineering, but I'm afraid it is the big agenda item. You know, this is what costs the money, and that doesn't look very attractive either. That's a massive operation if you're going to start boring under the cities. So where do we go from there? Well, the interesting thing about tunnelling, two interesting things about tunnelling. One is, actually, the UK is a world leader at tunnelling. We've done loads of tunnelling in this country over the last 20 years. We are one of the best in the world at tunnelling, funnily enough. The other thing is that it costs a sum of money which is roughly proportional to the amount of earth that you bore out. So that's sort of the square of the diameter of the tunnel. So as the diameter of your tunnel gets bigger and bigger, your costs go up as the square. Which is an odd way of saying if your tunnel diameter comes down, your costs come down with the square. So if you're down the bottom here, around about four metres diameter, that area that's signposted there with the arrow, you're in territory that's sort of eight to 12 million pounds a mile, which is actually quite cheap, relatively speaking, and it gets very much more expensive as you get bigger. And there's a couple of dots here. That big red dot at the top, that's the new San Gotthard tunnel that's been opened up in Switzerland. That's up the high end of the costs, massive tunnel through massive mountains, so you expect it to be up there. That dot down the bottom is a three metre tunnel that's been bored in Croydon. Nobody knows about this, but this is actually a cable tunnel. And I do have to be careful because this dot here is the Jubilee line. So you can be wrong about these things, but for tonight I'm going to ignore that dot there and I'm going to talk about the one which is close to the Croydon Cable Tunnel. That's what you get for your eight to 10 million pound a mile. It's a three meter diameter tunnel. And here's a man standing in the middle of it and it's got a fair finish. If you were to put a railway through that, you'd have to put a whole load of permanent way in and signaling and power systems, all that sort of stuff. If you were to run this bullet bus that I described five minutes ago in that, all you'd have to do is put down a tarmac strip for the wheels to run on. So this actually becomes quite an attractive sort of proposition. And this is the boring machine. This isn't anything like as horrific as that thing I showed you a few moments ago. This is actually quite a dinky little machine which can get dropped down a hole in a back street. So suddenly this becomes quite a doable sort of proposition. So could we really go underneath our cities? Well, before you answer that question, is the small tunnel any use to us, you have to ask yourself, what could you get down the small tunnel? Because if you can't get a vehicle down the small tunnel that's capable of carrying people, yeah, what's the point of having a small tunnel? But it doesn't take very long to have a look at other sorts of transport system. And this is the Embraer ERJ145. It's a sort of regional jet. You typically get about 100 people in a jet like this. It has a cross-section like this, and funnily enough, the fuselage is 2.3 metres in diameter. So this would go down our cable tunnel with a fair bit of room to spare, actually. And that's what it looks like inside, and people will sit inside that for an hour and not be at all unhappy. So that's quite an interesting sort of concept. 
Could we saw the wings off the plane, and the tail plane off the plane, and stuff it down a small tube, and what would that look like, and what might it cost? Well, there's our 2.3 meter fuselage, and there's our 3 meter Croydon cable tunnel, and you can see that it fits inside. And you might say to me, yeah, well, you're a professor, and you can sort of talk about these things. It's all arm-waving. You couldn't really do that, because that's too tight a fit. Well, actually, there's the northern line. <laughs> And I have done the calculations, and the blockage ratio on this is much higher than the blockage ratio on what I'm talking about. In fact, if I superimpose them, there's what I'm talking about. This is a considerably smaller tunnel, and therefore cheaper. It's a 3.5 meter tunnel, is the northern line. And there in blue is our jet with the wings sawed off. So actually, this sort of makes sense. You could actually do this in terms of the space you get and, and, and the technical uh, ability to do it. All sounds quite interesting. And here it is down here at 10 to 20 million pounds a mile. So this now is opening up the possibility of putting a mass transit system underneath the city, provided you've got reasonably good geological conditions, the cost is very doable. This could open the door to a mass transit system for small cities. Wouldn't that be an exciting idea? So of course we weren't blind to that in Cambridge, had a quick look. I showed you the vehicle flows, 7,500 vehicles per hour at peak, 10,000 people per hour at peak. They come in from four directions. If we were to put an underground mass transit system into Cambridge that was designed to deal with the flows that I've just been telling you about, what would it look like? Well, it would come in like this in a star sort of pattern and they'd all converge in the centre. And we would have a system that looked like this. First thing in the morning, there's a whole load of trains at the west end and a whole load of trains at the east end. These are my convoys of lorries. They can couple up electronically. They don't have to couple physically. So the first train out in the morning happens to be coming in and three of them gang together and they go off down the tube. This system is designed to give you a four minute frequency. The speed is 120 miles an hour and the capacity 2,000 people per hour. And this is a two to three mile leg. So these figures work for a leg that is two to three miles long. When it gets to the other end, it parks up in the available spaces, and then one comes in the opposite direction. Note, there's only a single tunnel. There are not two tunnels, so we've halved the civil engineering cost. Because this thing moves fast enough that you can clear the tunnel of one vehicle before you put the other one back in it. So we've halved the big cost in this system, which is the civil engineering cost, through the use of a very fast mechanical engineering system. And then it ends up the other end, and each time you have a demand at either end, you couple up as many vehicles as you need, and you keep shuttling backwards and forwards. This shuttling principle is very important because it halves the cost of the tunnels you need. So here we are in Cambridge, four legs all converging on a point, and we have this shuttling idea going back and forth. No vehicle goes on to another line. It only ever shuttles on its own line. So you have to get out in the centre and get on another one. But the transit times are only two or three minutes between points, so that perhaps isn't too much of a problem. The point is, we've got 12 miles of tunnel in this with a combined capacity of 8,000 people per hour, which is pretty close to our target, and the cost is two to 300 million pounds. That really is bargain basement time for a mass transit system for a city. So this begins to approach a low cost mass transit system for small cities, and the principle is shuttling. The lines don't depend on each other, so you can build them out sequentially. So you build the bit that's most important to you first, and it works as a shuttle, and then the next, and then the next, and then the next, and then the next. You can build these patterns out until you have as much coverage as you need or can justify by the economics. This makes it very scalable at around about 10 to 20 million pounds per mile, which is a very affordable price now, and we don't have any problems now with disrupting the surface traffic or any of that stuff. And indeed, planning is a whole lot easier in a place like Cambridge. Try driving through the Fellows Garden at King's College with one of these vehicles, you wouldn't be very popular. Going underneath, nobody knows about it. But finally, what about our intercities? A nation is made up of its cities. It's very important to think about what happens in the cities. But what about between the cities? Can we tra transfer our affordable mass transit notion from small cities to geographically small nations. I don't want to call the UK a small nation, particularly at the time of the debate about Brexit, but in terms of geography, we're quite a small nation. Could we use this idea between our major cities? Well, that's a bit more challenging, really, 
But if you were to think about an awful lot of our cities, and if you think about the economic balance in our country, we have a horrible sort of magnet in the southeast where everything happens, and increasingly, it would appear, not much happens in other places, and there's a very serious north-south divide. If, however, we could connect all of our cities together in such a way that you could get on these shuttles and move between them at typically five minutes or so intervals, what would that do for the aggregation of those northern cities? That could transform the economic perspectives on the northern cities, and indeed any cities around the country. The key is that we need to move fast between the cities. And we get off at one place, and you know, at each node you have to get off the first shuttle and onto the second shuttle if you want to travel on. This makes it very much simpler in terms of switches and signalling and all of this sort of thing, because the vehicles only ever run on their own shuttle route. But trained transport economists tell me that would never work. Because who would go from Birmingham up to Sheffield, then get off the train and then get back on again and go Sheffield up to Leeds? It's well known that people don't like doing that and it greatly devalues a scheme if you have to have changeover points in the system. Except that on the London Underground, nobody would think twice about making two changes from line to line as they go across London and people do it every single day. So could we not begin to think about national metro instead of London metro? In this day and age, we ought to be thinking far beyond what our Victorian forebears thought about when they thought about the capacity and capability of our railways. Could we build a system all over the nation that was really like the London Underground? And the key to that is speed and frequency. You need to get from one, plate, from one point to another in probably less than five minutes. And you need to be able to be confident that when you get to the other place, you hop out of the vehicle and you move to the other platform, that there will be another one that comes along without fail within a few minutes. So let us say that in order to do this, you have to have a five-minute transit time between the cities and a less than five-minute wait as you trans uh, transition from one vehicle to the next. Could we do that? Well, that takes you into this territory. Everybody's very excited about Hyperloop at the moment. I talked about taking the Embraer, sawing the wings off and towing the tailplane off and putting it in a pipe. Well, this is taking a Dreamliner and doing the same, and as a consequence, it goes down the pipe at six or 700 miles an hour. Now, that sounds a bit fantastic, but so did the idea of a canal, and so did the idea of a conventional railway when they were first mooted. And indeed, flying in an aeroplane at 30 or 40,000 feet at 600 miles an hour, it's a pretty unusual idea if you think about it. So let's keep our minds open. The Hyperloop concept is something which has been mooted and a lot of people are very interested in it. This moves at five or 600 miles an hour. If you do the calculations, Manchester to Leeds, Leeds to York, all these cities that I showed you on the previous map, they can all be connected within five minutes if you had a system like this. I was lucky enough to be out in, uh, uh, in uh, California, uh, I beg your pardon, Nevada, uh, a few weeks ago at one of the first prototype tests for the Hyperloop system. Very impressive, but what was more impressive than anything else that I saw there was the rate at which it had been accomplished. I was at this Nevada test site in January and it was just desert. I was out there again in May, and they had this great long track there, and they showed the propulsion system for the proposed Hyperloop working. So within four months, they had designed and built the propulsion system. So these guys are moving at great speed, and this technology is very credible. So could we create a national metro within the UK? Running through the numbers, working it all out, yeah, we probably could. Te technologically, 60 to 80 million pounds a mile. That's a much bigger number than I was speaking about previously, and there it is on the famous old graph, but that's not far away from conventional rail prices, and it is well short of high-speed rail. So that's a very exciting concept. It says we could travel at five or 600 miles an hour at less than what we're about to pay for high-speed rail. Now, that defies logic. That can't be right. So just to end with, I would just say this to you. The costs that dominate these systems are the civil engineering costs, absolutely dominate the systems. If you build a smaller system, it costs you less.
Look at the difference in size between conventional rail and the Northern Line. And then remember that our vehicle is even smaller than the Northern Line. So what we're comparing is a system that will carry that very small blue outline compared to the system that is designed to carry trains of this type. It is demonstrably much smaller, and that is the key. The technology that goes inside that pipe might cost a lot of money to develop, but once it is developed, the vehicles themselves are a minor part of the total story. The story hinges around the heavy stuff in the ground, and that's why this thing is potentially much cheaper, enabled by technologies that have not been with us before. This is genuinely a new opportunity. We can and we should build a demonstration bullet system in this country. And we can and we could build a demonstration hyperloop system in this country. Think what that would do for the economics of our society. Thank you.